If you'd like to be turning to Matthew 13, that's where we'll be this morning. Matthew chapter 13, beginning verse 44. We have some Texans in the audience this morning, and we are glad that you are here. Whenever we can get somebody from the promised land to come up and visit, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks since I've been in the pulpit, and I appreciate all of your care and concern about my vacation. Uh, several of you asked why we didn't leave town. I didn't have anywhere to go. I just uh, We enjoyed our week here. I got to play golf twice, won one and lost one, shot a 92 both times, so now you know everything I know. Uh, it was a wonderful week. We didn't, uh, didn't do a whole lot of anything. Took the girls shopping one day in Enid, which I avoid usually at all costs, but uh, we had a good day and, and uh, a good week, and appreciate you, uh, those of you who filled in and did different things while I was gone, or not gone as the case may be, to make sure that things went smoothly. This is at the end of Jesus' explanation of some parables. If you remember, the disciples were in the in crowd. Jesus was giving them explanations to these parables. He was telling the crowds, but to the crowds, he didn't explain these things. And so that you have this little inner circle, this little group that knows things that other people don't really know. And as Jesus is explaining all of these things, to his disciples, he finally comes to another parable that seems to be directed somewhat at them and somewhat at the crowd. Look at the beginning in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went out and sold all that he had, and he bought that pearl. Now all of us are familiar with these parables. I want us to talk for just a few minutes about what Jesus might have been trying to do with his disciples at this point, what he was trying to encourage in their lives. Now when I read this parable, I don't know about you, but my mind works a little weird sometimes. The thing that popped into my brain was Popeil. You know that guy, Ron Popeil? He has sold everything in the world from little miniature uh, fishing gear to, uh, what's he selling now, the thing you, you set it and forget it. You guys watch TV. There's this uh, rotisserie cooker that he's got now. He has had something on the market for the last 30 years. The man is a marketing genius. But the one thing that I remember most from Ron Popeil is that question. Now, how much would you pay? You remember when he had the, the thing that it slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries? You remember that one? If you buy it within the next 20 minutes, we'll throw in a set of Ginsu knives. But wait, that's not all. We'll also give you this, you know, and that, and we'll give you this. And, and he always asked the question, now how much would you pay? I'm not going to charge you $59.95. I'm not going to charge you $39.95. What's the price? $19.95. Ronco, 19, it was always 1995. You could buy the man's house for 1995 if he could just, you know, if you gave him long enough on one of his infomercials. Jesus says, now what would you pay for the kingdom of heaven? How important is it to you? Ron Popeil's always working the price down. Jesus shoots the price up and says, I want you to give everything. I want it to be the most important thing in your existence. There was a man and he went out into a field and he found a treasure in the field and so he hid it again to make sure that nobody else found it before he could buy that field. He goes out, he gets the deed to the field and he throws a party, he's so excited, he rejoices because he found that one thing that was the most important thing. Physical treasure? No, the kingdom. He found the kingdom. Another man was a merchant, bought and sold pearls. He found one pearl that was more beautiful than all the rest. He gave up everything he had so he could own that one pearl. Now those of us that are not very materialistic look at those scenarios and think, well, that's kind of stupid. You know, After you got that treasure, what good is the treasure in and of itself? You know, you spend it. You buy other stuff. He sold everything that he had so he could possess the, pre the treasure. What about the pearl? 
I mean, it's nice to have a nice pearl, but you give up everything you've got in the entire world. You sell everything that you have so that you could own one little piece of sand that's been cultivated into a pearl. Jesus says, that's the kingdom. That's the principle I want you to get, that there is nothing as important as the kingdom of heaven. Now look at our lives. At what point has the kingdom of heaven been everything? to us at what point has the kingdom of heaven been all we were interested in at what point in our lives was the kingdom of heaven that which we would sell everything we had give up everything that we define ourselves as being so we could just have that one thing you know why because it's kind of like the treasure and the pearl we go well, that doesn't make any sense you see I, I need to be a businessman and I need to be a family man, and I need to be a, a part of the community, and I need to be all of these things, and yeah, those are all things that we are, but would you give up all of that to make the kingdom the most important thing? Would we give up bank accounts? Would we give up houses and cars and boats and friends? And all the things that define us just so we could be part of the kingdom? And the answer is, not very often. And yet Jesus says, I want everything you have or nothing at all. If you're not willing to take up your cross and follow after me, you're not worthy of me. If you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy of me. One comes and says, let me first go bury my father. Jesus says, you come follow me. Let the dead bury their own dead. That's harsh because it's not how we're used to looking at life. We're used to having everything. You know, I can have Burger King for lunch and McDonald's for supper. This is a, a, a nation where you can have it all, where you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. And Jesus says, no, I want you to give up everything and just be a kingdom person. The kingdom is worth more than anything else that we can ask or imagine. Now when Jesus was saying these things, he was preaching to the choir. He was talking to a group of men who had given up who they had been in the past just so they could follow Jesus. Just for a few cases in point, James and John, what was their job? They were fishermen. They were working with their dad in the boat, taking care of their uh, responsibilities, being who they thought they were supposed to be. Jesus comes walking by says, you guys follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They leave their father and the nets and the boats and the servants and they follow Jesus. How much did they give up? They had a complete change of life, didn't they? Everything was different from that day on. And it wasn't that they gave up physically something that was bad for something that was good because their life with Jesus on the road wasn't always that spectacular. I mean, it was neat to be with Jesus and it was great to see the miracles and be part of the power that was at work, but they slept out in the open. Well, to put it in Jesus' words, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. His companions lived a nomadic life as they traveled from place to place so the gospel could be preached. They left home. They left dad. They left a steady job to go search out the kingdom. What about Matthew, the guy who wrote this down for us? He had a pretty lucrative job, didn't he? Tax collector. He was probably well off physically, but not socially. You know, not too many people liked him, but he could probably buy enough friends, or at least he had other tax collectors that he could hang out with. When Jesus calls him, he leaves his job and throws a party for Jesus and begins following Jesus. What about Simon Zelotes, Simon the Zealot? He was a member of the Sakari. You know who the Sakari were? They were an anti-Roman league within the Jewish underbelly. They carried around little swords. That's why they were called the Sakari. It was the name of their little sword that they carried with them. And they had sworn that they were going to kill all the Romans that they could kill. They were the ones that were responsible for kind of getting the uprising going in 67, 68, 69 AD, 
They're the reason that the temple got torn down and burned to the ground in 70 AD. The Sakari were all part of that. The folks up on the hill at Masada who committed suicide rather than be taken by the Romans, lots of them were the Sakari. And so Simon the Zealot leaves behind a political agenda and follows a guy who is preaching what? Peace, love, the kingdom. Not the kingdom of this world, not the, uh, the uh, agenda of the Sakari, not let's take back Jerusalem from the Romans, but the kingdom of God. So he's preaching to the choir. He's talking to people who have left a lot of things to be his followers. In fact, Jesus tells his disciples on one occasion, not one person who has left behind home or family or lands for my name's sake, but you'll receive a hundredfold now and in the world to come. Leave what's least important for that which is most important. Well, let's continue our reading. Verse 47 it's not about our decision, but it's about a decision based on our decision. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When we decide what's most important in our life, it sets in motion another set of choices. You see, when God and Christ are seen in Scripture, they're seen as the judges. They're the ones who make the decision about life and death based on our response to them. But the angels are always seen as those who have to go in and do the work. They're the ones that reap the harvest. They're the ones that separate out the fish. They help in the judgment process. And so here he talks about the angels coming and separating as one would separate the good fish from the bad fish. Now James and John understood this quite well. Peter and Andrew, they'd been here. They'd done that. They'd sat there with their fathers and they'd separated out the good fish from the bad fish. They knew what was good to eat. They knew what was just a garbage fish. I didn't know that until I met Kelly. And Kelly and I used to go bass fishing together. Now, those of you that don't know Kelly, he was the preacher here before me. And this September, we will have been best friends 25 years. Love him to death. He, he is in Missouri this week, by the way, preaching at the new congregation that they're moving to. And I'll, I'll give you more information about that, give him address and phone number when he gets here. But he taught me to bass fish. He also taught me what fish were not worth keeping. Uh, every now and then, we would catch a really nice bass, four, five, six pounders, really put up a good fight, big, healthy-looking bass. We always put them back because we want to catch them again later. But there was one kind of fish that we would just throw up on the bank. Anybody ever catch a carp? I caught a carp one time that had things growing on it. It was the oddest-looking fish you've ever seen. It was diseased. It had tumors on its sides and so when I finally dragged it up on the shore that's where it stayed I wasn't putting that fish back in the water didn't know whether it might harm another fish didn't know what but it was just ugly enough it needed to die so we put it up on the shore and just left it there Jesus says when the angels come in the end of the age they're going to be looking to see are you a beautiful bass or are you a diseased carp are you one that has brought glory to God by your existence or are you one that chose to bring glory to yourself are you a bottom feeder? Are you one who's only in it for yourself? Or have you sold everything so that you could be part of the kingdom of heaven? Have you chosen that which is the most important thing? Now I think, really, if push came to shove, we'd make the right decision. If someone came and put a gun to our head and said, you know, recant your Christianity or die, I think we'd go to heaven proud of our connection with Christ. But when it's easy like it is now, when there's no one standing in our face and saying, you better uh, you know, recant your Christianity, you better uh, leave behind your faith, when we're in a society that's just pluralistic and says, Christianity's great, just live your Christianity quietly, don't bother the rest of us, and we'll just kind of go on. And we can have it all, or so it seems, I think it's harder for us to really realize 
that which is the most important thing. Jesus finishes up by asking his disciples if they understand what he's saying. And they said yes. In verse 52, he says to them, Every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things old and new. In other words, you've learned a lot in your lives so far. You grew up under the old covenant. It was a great covenant. It taught you a lot of things about my father. But now I'm going to give you some new information and you're going to grow even more and you're going to go out and you're going to take the gospel to the entire world. And so his disciples are gathering in wonderful things from their past and they're gathering in wonderful things from their association with Jesus and they're going to be able to draw from both storehouses, the old and the new, and take that message out and give it to people. We're like that. Every time we go into scripture, Something new comes to us. Some new bit of wisdom, some new bit of knowledge, some new understanding of something that we just didn't quite have in line before. And we add that to the wisdom and the knowledge that we've gained from our association with Christ in the past. And we take our old knowledge and our new knowledge and we share. But why? Why is it important? Because there are a lot of people around us who don't know what treasure is. They wouldn't have a clue. If they stumbled on it out in the field, they wouldn't know to sell everything and buy that field because they just don't recognize treasure when they see it. There's some people that just don't know what the prettiest pearl looks like. But you and I do. And we have the opportunity every day to show people what God has given us to introduce them to the gospel, to give them the opportunity to get rid of that which is not worth keeping, to sell out and to buy that one perfect gift, that one perfect treasure to hang on to the kingdom at all costs. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for showing us the truth about the kingdom. We thank you for putting in our hearts the joy of being part of your kingdom. We thank you for giving us faith, and for giving us the courage to act on that faith. Lord, we pray that you will bless all those who are here today. Help us that we might seek the kingdom first, that it will hold first place in our lives, that we would be willing to give up everything else just to be with you, just to promote your kingdom. And Lord, we pray for those who are outside and who don't know of your joy, who don't know of your salvation. Lord, help us to share with anyone that will listen. In Jesus we pray. Amen. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, we want to help you and encourage you any way we can as we sing. Thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come just as I am thy love unknown has broken.